Welcome to this course on Reaching Your World. I am so excited for the opportunity to come alongside you to help train and equip you to reach your world with the gospel. You are making an investment not only in your life and your walk with God, but in your ministry to the world. As a Christian, as a believer, you are called by God not only to have peace, have forgiveness, have the assurance of heaven, but to help communicate and share and take that message to people that may have never heard the gospel before. So over these next 10 sessions, you are investing in your walk with God and your ministry to the world. I'm going to help lay a foundation where you understand who you are, what you carry on the inside of you, and what God has called you and equipped you to do. I want to help you give you an understanding of what the gospel message really is, how to share it effectively. And I also want to help see you activated in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit, because this world needs a demonstration of God's power. Friends, we are living in such an incredible time on planet Earth. There is no time that I would rather be living in than now. God is raising up not only an army, but a family of people that can communicate in love and demonstrate the power and love of the gospel. So over this next 10 sessions, I just encourage you to put a draw on what the Holy Spirit would want to teach you, what he would want to communicate to you, and, and uh, determine. You'll make a decision in your own heart that you are going to receive everything that the Holy Spirit wants you to receive over these next sessions. Let that be your prayer today. So let's jump right in. Session number one, we're going to be talking about the believer's priority, and I want to help lay a foundation for why we do evangelism, why we make disciples. You know, when I was a new believer, um, when I had uh, encountered in 1996, I encountered the power of God in a very real and personal and powerful way, and it changed my life. I went from being a spectator who understood about God, who believed in God, who believed that Jesus died for my sins, to being a participant who actively was engaging in missions. But one of the things that was, that was really key when that took place in my life is immediately I had a desire to share the message with other people. I wanted to tell somebody. And I believe that that is true Christianity, is you have experienced for the love of God for yourself and you have a desire to communicate the message to other people. So right from the start, we need to understand that if you are a Christian or a believer, you're called to be a witness. You are a witness for Jesus Christ. You are a witness to the gospel. You're a witness to what God has done in your life. And not only are you called to witness or to share and communicate the truth of the gospel, but you're called to make disciples. If you are a true disciple, a follower, a learner of Jesus Christ, then you are going to want to make disciples of other people. So as Christians, we're called to witness and we're called to make disciples of people around us, of our communities, and of the nations. So evangelism. And oftentimes what I do when I teach on evangelism is I ask people, what is the very first thought or word or emotion that comes to your mind when you hear the word evangelism? And uh, it's interesting to hear people's responses. And oftentimes um, people have this re religious concept of an evangelist or evangelism, and they, they think of someone picketing on the side of the road or, or a hell, fire, and brimstone. You know, for me, when bef before I, I understood the true message of the gospel, when I thought of evangelism, um, words like cheesy came to mind, awkward, manipulative, things that, uh, that you really didn't want to, uh, to be associated with. And if that comes to mind when you hear the word evangelism, my friends, then I am diagnosing you with something called evangelophobia. That is the fear of everything associated with evangelism. But I want to take the time, and I believe you do too, to really come to grasp that evangelism, the work of bringing the good news to people, is for every believer. It's not for a select few. Every believer, you're called to share and show the gospel and make disciples. It's not just for a few people. It's for every single Christian. And evangelism, um, and I don't even like to use that terminology, but it should be the most natural thing. It is, an, It should become 
an overflow of our identity and who we are in Jesus Christ. And so over this next 10 sessions, you're going to hopefully get a real strong biblical basis and be activated where it becomes a lifestyle. So let's look at some of the, the problem of, of why Christians don't engage. You know, recently I looked at some different statistics online from the Barna Group, a very well-respected um, organization that collects statistics within religion. Um, and, you know, one statistic that I read, it said 42% of Christians think that it's wrong to evangelize. 42%, nearly half of the Christians that were interviewed here in America thought that evangelism was wrong. You see, we have been indoctrinated to think that it is, it is offensive to share what we believe. Now, there is definitely a wrong and a right way to do this. And unfortunately, in the past, Christians have been associated with just shoving what we believe down people's throats. And, uh, you know, too often, Christians are more known for what they're against than when they're, what they're actually for. And I don't know about you, but I want people to know what I'm for. And so that's what we're talking about today. What are you for? I'm for people. I'm for the love of God. I'm for the gospel. I'm for helping people, setting people free. Here was another statistic. Um, they asked a certain amount of Christians if they had ever heard of the Great Commission. And uh, it was interesting to hear people's response. 31% of those that were interviewed, they were not sure. They were not sure what the Great Commission was. Uh, 15 or 51% had never heard of the Great Commission. And only 17% of those Christians, and these are born-again Christians here in America, they actually only 17% had heard and could tell you what the Great Commission was. Now, when Jesus Christ, before he went up to the Father, he left a final mandate to the church. And we call it the Great Commission. Um, but it was, it was the final mandate of Jesus Christ. And he told that many different times, in many different ways, in different settings to different groups of people. And I want to look at a few of, um, of those references in Scripture. The Great Commission. But before, before let, me, let me use a story to illustrate this. Um, you know, a number of years ago, on a Monday morning, I got up and I was going into uh, to the office and my wife said, Hey, sweetie, um, I know it's Monday, but on Friday we have some friends coming over and I am preparing a great Italian meal for them. Now, I've got everything we need, she said. The only thing I need you to do is get the bread. I've already got it all. Just get the bread. And I said, just like any good husband, I said, don't worry about it, sweetie. I got you covered. Tuesday rolls around. Same thing happens. I get up. I'm heading into the office. She says, sweetie, just don't forget to get bread. By, to, by Friday, have the bread. And I said, I got it. Wednesday, the same thing. Thursday, the same thing. Friday, I wake up. I wasn't going into the office. And so um, my wife was going out with, uh, to do some shopping. And so I decided I wanted to bless my wife and just show her how grateful I was for her. And so Friday, I got up and I and I, I cleaned the house. I went and cut the grass. I, I did some gardening, did some weeding for her. And uh, I even ran down to the store and got some special drinks for, for the evening. And uh, you know, about five o'clock, about 30 minutes before our friends were gonna roll, in, roll up for dinner, my wife shows up and she says, wow, you did all this. You cleaned the house, you, you, know, you, you, uh, you cut the grass, it looks great. Oh, you even picked up some extra food. And she said, thank you. You didn't forget the bread, did you? <laughs> and you know, if you're a married man, you can we can all relate to that. Where we did, I did everything that she she wanted, even beyond. But the only thing, the priority, I managed to forget and neglect. And uh, you know, as Christians, I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in our our ministries, our church programs, and and what we do that we miss. Um, the very heart of God, the priority, which is giving the love, giving the love that we've experienced to lost and hurting people. So that needs to become our priority. Jesus gave the Great Commission in many different occasions to many different groups of people, but it is our priority. This is the biblical basis, our priority. As believers, it must be to share that message with other people. 
So let's look at a few of these examples. Now, the early church, if you read through the book of Acts, they not only, they, they not only had experienced the power of God, but they had a burning desire to share that message with other people. And if you comb through the book of Acts, you'll see that every believer shared the gospel. Um, in the early parts of the book of Acts, you see that the, the apostles, you know, the apostles, uh, they had kind of a monopoly on ministry. But then a persecution happened in, in the church in Jerusalem, and the believers were all spread out. And it says that they all went, all the disciples, all the believers, and they shared the word of God wherever they went. So God's heart has always been that every one of us would make disciples. So back to the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, is probably um, the most well-known reference to the Great Commission. Now, this is after Jesus Christ went to the cross, um, paid the price for our sin, after he uh, went into the grave, rose from the dead, ascended, or, and uh, you know, before he ascended to the Father, he met with his disciples. And you can go back and, and read this, but he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. God's heart has always been discipleship. It's always been multiplication. It's not just about making converts. It's about making disciples that, that, that understand the heart of God and can share that message. So he gave us a mandate. He said that we're to go and we're to make disciples of all the nations. Now, let me say this. He says that we're to disciple nations. Not only are we supposed to make individual disciples of people, but we're actually supposed to disciple nations, disciple the different areas of society, you know, business, economics, the arts, music. We're supposed to disciple society in the ways of the Lord, in the teachings of Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. So we're supposed to disciple the nations. In Acts 14, 21 and 22, it says that, Paul went to a such and such a city and he preached the gospel and he made many disciples. Now, in the, the early church example, there was no separation between evangelism and discipleship. That was something that we created later on and that's not God's desire. We are called to not only share the gospel, but make disciples. That's the example from scripture. Matthew 24, verse 14. Um, you know, Jesus said, when he's talking about the end of days and the end times and the last things, he says, this gospel, Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached or communicated in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So in the last times before Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on the earth, he, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom must go out to all the world as a testimony to all nations. Friends, that is a lot more. The gospel of the kingdom is a lot more than just the gospel of salvation. Now, we are saved, but the gospel of the kingdom is the message of God's rule and God's reign. It's God's big picture. And later on in this session, we're going to talk about the gospel of the kingdom because that is the message as believers that we are called to share. So on this reference, Jesus said that we're to preach the gospel of the kingdom as a testimony to all na nations. And that word nations means all tribes, all tongues, all people groups. Everyone needs an opportunity to hear the message. And Jesus said, before that takes place, or before I return, that message has to go out. Mark 16, 15. Jesus said, go and preach the good news. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So in Matthew, the emphasis is make disciples. In Mark, he says that we're going to go to, and preach a message. We have a message. We need to communicate this message because you can't make a disciple of someone who's never been born again. So many of our churches are filled with people that have never been born again, and they need to hear the gospel and they need to believe. But in Mark, and uh, for, for the, for, um, because of time's sake, I'm not going to go into it, but he says that these signs will follow those who believe. And he begins to explain, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents, they will, if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So when we go out, 
in obedience to Jesus Christ in the Great Commission, we can expect signs to follow. We can ex expect to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speak in new tongues. We can expect protection and safety. And then we can expect that demons are going to flee and that we will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That was Mark. Luke chapter 24, Jesus talks about wait for the promise of the Father. You heard me, me, me talk about him. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me. He says, wait for power. We need power. Um, John 20, 21, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. We could talk a long time about that, but when Jesus or God the Father sent Jesus, he sent him with a ministry, and that ministry was Isaiah 61. You'll remember Jesus got up in Luke chapter 4, and he opened the scroll, and he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal broken-hearted people, um, to proclaim freedom to the captives, the opening of sight to the blind, and to proclaim the acceptable, or the year of the Lord's favor. So when God sent Jesus, he sent him with a good news message with power to heal brokenhearted, to open blind eyes, and to set oppressed people free. And then God tells us, or Jesus tells us, that in the same way that he was sent, he sends us. Man, that is exciting. That gets me excited. God trusts us. He believes in us. And then there's Acts chapter 1-8. He says that, uh, and I want to I want to emphasize a few of these. So I'm going to go ahead and and open up my Bible. You know, Scripture is, it must be the backbone and the foundation of everything we believe. And uh, right from the beginning of my walk with God, my Christian life, I determined that Scripture, if I couldn't find it in Scripture, specifically the New Testament, then I wasn't going to believe it. I wasn't going to follow it. And Scripture must be the foundation. So in Acts chapter 1-8, um, before Jesus went up to the Father, he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he empowered him for ministry. And what we've got to understand is that Jesus was a man just like us. Um, scripture tells us, Philippians chapter 2 and others, that, that Jesus laid aside his royalty and he came in, as, in the nature of a servant. Jesus was not only the Son of God, but the Son of Man. And if Jesus needed to receive power... We also need to allow the Holy Spirit to empower us. The Spirit comes into us when we're born again. We become a new creation. Um, we, you know, this, we, we're, we're, we're regenerated. We're born again. But when the Spirit comes upon us, that's for our world. And Jesus says that you will receive power. And we know that that word power is the, the Greek word dunamis. We get dynamite, but we also get dynamic. Um, dynamic, it means dynamic ability. And I don't know about you, but I need God's dynamic ability in me to share his love, to share his power with the world, because I know my limitations. I know my background. I know my weaknesses. And the, the good news is that the Holy Spirit comes upon us to empower us. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that power is not just to speak in tongues or to, you know, to prophesy as good as those things are. But he says that power is to make you a witness of me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what you got to understand is that Jesus was giving us the scope of where we were supposed to take the gospel. He was said, you're supposed to do it locally. Share the gospel locally. Jerusalem, Judea. You know, go across state lines and, and you know, share the gospel in your state and the states nearby or, or your province or your territory, wherever, you're, wherever you live. And he says, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, if you've ever wondered, why did he highlight Samaria? Now, Samaria was like its own little nation within a nation. And the Samaritans, they were, um, they were an overlooked people group. They were a mixture of Jews with other nations, and so they were very despised. So Jesus makes an emphasis to say that we're supposed to take the gospel to the overlooked and the forgotten, to the least, the lost, and the last. God has a heart for overlooked ones. So the Great Commission 
It has to be the heartbeat of our mission as Christians on this earth. It, it is the mandate that Jesus Christ left before he went up to the Father. And unfortunately, I think it's the most neglected. We're good at prayer. We're good at uh, you know, spiritual warfare. We have worship conferences, and I, I love all these things. They're great. But at the heartbeat of Jesus Christ's last mandate for the church is the Great Commission, reaching and discipling nations. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Paul addresses young Timothy, who was, uh, he was, he was one of his team. Um, he was potentially a, um, a teenager. He was a young man. We know that from Scripture. And as you read through the books of Timothy, Timothy really struggled with issues of identity. Paul over and over said, no, don't be ashamed to testify. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid. And so maybe like me, you've struggled with self-worth and timidity and fear and I've got some encouragement for you today. Uh, Paul told Timothy, who was not an evangelist, who was not bold, who was not yet confident, he left in Ephesus to oversee the church. But in 2 Timothy 4, verse 5, he says, Be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So you might say, I'm, I'm not an evangelist, I, you know, I have other giftings. But every believer is called to do the work of an evangelist. You are called to reach and make disciples with the gospel. Um, you, and, and, and here's the beautiful thing. God needs you with your gift, with your talents, with what you have. You are an individual. You are created in the likeness and image of God, and you are called to share that message. So he says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I hope you're being blessed. I hope you're tuning in. This is only uh, lesson number one. Take good notes because uh, there's, there's going to be tests. For those of you that are participating in the Bible school, there's going to be tests after every other, um, every two sessions. So take notes and really take notes that you can go back and glean some from. So Ephesians, I want to look now at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Um, these are familiar verses where the Apostle Paul talks about the role of leadership. The role of leadership in the church and really what the church is, or church leadership is called to do. And uh, unfortunately, it is very different than oftentimes what we're told in, uh, in, and, and demonstrated in church. Ephesians 4 verse 23. The purpose of leadership, this is what the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul says, actually not verse 23, verse 12, it says, he himself, verse 11 and 12, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So Paul lays out the five-fold ministry. He says that before Jesus went up to the Father, he designated some to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And uh, the point, the, the goal of this teaching is not to talk about each of those ministry gifts or uh, don't try to figure out if, if you are an evangelist or you are a pastor or a prophet or apostle. Um, but the goal of those ministry gifts and what they're called to do is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ. So you have to understand if you are in a place of leadership and many of the people that are that are taking this, this video course on reaching your world, you are actively working as a pastor, maybe an evangelist, or maybe you're just someone that wants to, you wants to hone in on your gifting and calling to share Jesus with other people. But if you have any type of, of leadership in your life, and we're all called to lead and to influence, our job is to equip God's people for the work of ministry. In the past, we saw the work of leadership as, uh, as, as it was their job to do all the ministry. But according to the Apostle Paul, who I think has certain things to say about leadership, he says the goal of leadership 
should be to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, that work or that word equip is a very interesting word in the original language. And there's another place that it's used in um, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 21, we have the story of the apostles before they were called by Jesus. And it says that they were sitting on the, on the beach on the shores of Galilee and they were mending their nets. And in those days, you've got to understand, they, they fished with large nets that uh, they were interwoven, twine and yarn and different things. And, and they, would, they would, before they would go fishing, they would actually knit them together and fix them so that their catch would not slip out. They would do things like oil them, they would mend them, they would sew them. And so in that story, it says that the, the fishermen were sitting on the, on the shore of Galilee, mending their nets. That word mend is the word equip that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. So we are not just to equip people, give them the tools, but we're to make them whole in the love of God. We're to equip them in the love of God and to build up the body of Christ. So that is the goal of leadership, is to equip people for ministry. You are called to equip people for the work of ministry. John 4, verse 17, it's, it, um, John talks about love being perfected. And, and he goes through this cycle where the love of God, when truly grasped, truly understood, it affects our view and opinion of God, of ourselves, and that it empowers us to minister to the world. So the goal of, of leadership must be to make people whole in the love of God so that they can take this message to the world. Amen? I want to look at one more, one more concept. When we're talking about evangelism, when we're talking about discipleship, when we're talking about reaching our world, we've, we, we, we see that there's, there's a problem here that we don't grasp, that we, we don't engage, and some of that has to do with a wrong understanding of God, a wrong understanding of our value and our identity. And in one of the sessions, we're going to deal with some of those heart beliefs. Um, we begin to grasp as well that the Great Commission must be our primary mission. But in understanding the Great Commission, we have to understand that our motive and our message is everything. And so many Christians have never grasped the true message of the gospel, and we'll get into that later, but so many Christians have heard a, a mixed message, a message that says God is good, but sometimes he's bad. God is happy, and sometimes he's angry. God heals, but sometimes he doesn't. So we need a pure gospel message to take to the world. And if, if you're investing in your life by taking part in this series, then you understand that the message and the motive is everything. In Isaiah chapter 52, um, Isaiah, he talks about, he says, you know, why do my people wail? Um, it's, and then he goes on and he says, their, their leaders bring them into captivity. But then he, he says that, but there will come a day when they will know my name. And then it will be said, he says in verse 7, he says, it'll be said, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation, the good news that the God of Israel reigns. In 22 years of ministry, in over 30 nations of the world, we've seen tens of thousands, um, possibly over a million people respond to the gospel message. But oftentimes what I've seen is that the message that is being preached is not good news. And Isaiah tells us that there's going to come a day when there will be messengers who bring the good news of the gospel of peace and salvation. Friends, we have a good news message. We have a message that the world needs to know. Um, we have a message that sets people free. Um, the gospel, and, and you know, the word gospel is this, this Greek word evangel, and um, you know, we know it as good news. But in early Bible times, it was not just 
hey, you know, good news, there's been, I, you know, I got, a, I got a new job, or, you know, good news, I'm not being sued and taken to jail. It was a word that was rarely used, and it was only used for an extraordinary, um, something extraordinary that happens. And in those days, it was used for usually two occasions. The one is if there was a new emperor on the throne, and the second was if there was a great military battle. So this is, as you can see, is a very unique word that I think we overlook and we grasp and we make the message, um, the message of the gospel just about going to heaven when you die. Um, and as good as that is, that is not the heart of the gospel. Or we make the message of the gospel just about, you know, being forgiven. You can be forgiven. God can forgive you of your sins. And again, that is, that is part of the gospel. We are, we are forgiven. Um, but that's still not the heart behind it. Or here in America, and maybe in the nation where, where you're from, we think of the gospel as being a type of music or being a gospel Christian. You're a moral person. You're a Christian. But that still doesn't get to the heart of what the gospel means. In John 17, verse 3, he says, This is eternal life. Now, the gospel and eternal life, those, those things are synonymous. But he says, this is eternal life, that they might know you, Father, and Jesus the Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is not something that takes place when we die and go to heaven. According to Jesus, our model and our example, eternal life starts the moment you're born again, and it is knowing God. So the gospel is good news. It's about eternal life. Now, even the word salvation, and, and it's so important that we grasp the true meaning of some of these words because the word saved or salvation might mean three different things to three different people. But if you go back to the original language, and, um, and you should already grasp this, but the New Testament, the majority of it was written in Greek. Um, certain parts were written in Aramaic, uh, specifically the Gospel of Matthew. Um, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but it's so important that we grasp the true meaning of these words. And with uh, with with uh, with the world today and the internet, you can you can download apps where you can actually just click on the word as you're reading through the Bible, and it will pull up the the Greek and Hebrew. And that's just a very basic way that you can get into the original meaning of these words. But the word "saved" comes from a Greek word called "sozo." And, so uh, and salvation is the Greek word soteria, and they're they're the same root word sozo, saved. And in the Bible, it just translated as, as saved. Um, but in the original language, the concept was being saved not only from sin but from the consequences of sin. And it talks about being saved, being forgiven, being healed, being given peace, being caused to prosper, made whole, made well, given rest. It is this all-inclusive word that deals with the whole person. So when the Apostle Paul said, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, he's saying that it is the same gospel message that saves someone from sin, that heals them, that causes them to prosper, that gives them emotional health and well-being. This word salvation or, or saved is for the whole person. So I, I hope you're beginning to grasp that this gospel message that we are called to take to the world, it is mind-blowing. It is incredible, and that way or too few people have really grasped the message of the gospel. I like to say, mo much of the world has been Christianized, but has not been evangelized. Now, evangelism in the truest sense is to communicate, share, and demonstrate the good news, and we are call all called to do that. We're called to not only proclaim, but to show the good news. So the gospel is good news. A number of years ago, I was traveling back from a conference, and I was in a, an area of the United States that we call the Bible Belt, and it's an area where there is many Christians. Um, you know, it's it's culturally, it's a Christian area, and there's many good things that come with that. I am thankful that there's many areas in the United States that are still are have a biblical foundation and a biblical worldview, 
but I was driving to the airport um, early in the morning and I felt like I was supposed to, to share the gospel with the, my taxi driver who was a young lady in her 30s and I could tell that life had been hard because she was driving the night shift to take care of her, her children. And uh, I just, as I was trying to talk, I said, have you ever heard what the Bible calls the gospel before? And, you know, we were in a very Christian area there. And she said, yeah, I've, I've heard the gospel. My grandma used to tell me that I was a sinner and I was going to hell. And I said, I said, that is not the gospel. And so I said, I'm going to tell you the gospel and, then, and I'm going to give you the message in, in the next 60 seconds because we were getting close to the airport. And so I just begin to share the good news as I communicate it. I talked about creation. I talked about uh, sin and the consequences. I talked about Christ's work of redemption and then our response, that all we have to do is put faith in what Jesus Christ has done. And as we pulled up to the curb, I looked at this young lady and I said, if, if God loves you this much, why don't you give your life to Jesus Christ? You know, believe in him. And at this time, she's, you know, her, her eyes are, are tearing up and she looks at me and she says, yeah, that's, that's what I want. And I, I got to lead that lady to the Lord and, uh, and then connect her with, with a local church in that area. You know, for me, it was eye opening. Don't just assume that everyone around you knows the gospel. Uh, there's many places in Africa that are traditionally Christian, um, nations and everyone, uh, by birth considers them a Christian. There's places in uh, the Middle East and Asia that I've been, that if you're born into a Christian family, you are Christian by birth. Now, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than you know, going to the hardware store or going to the hamburger place makes you a hamburger. It takes faith in Jesus Christ, and we, we all know that. But don't believe that everyone already knows the true message of the gospel. And because you know, we're engaging in this study to help give you tools to share and show the gospel of Jesus Christ. So keep the message simple. We've got to keep that message simple. Don't complicate it. The world is, um, is too complicated as it is. We have a good news message. I, I, love, I love looking through scripture and trying to find the simplest gospel message possible. And, uh, you know, here's, here is Jesus's gospel message. He said it in a, uh, about eight words. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave. That was the gospel message according to Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave. Not complicated. A child can understand. Or what about John the Baptist? He did the gospel in five words. He said, behold the Lamb of God. That's in John 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God. Or, or this one from the Apostle Paul is, is, is a little bit more complete. He says, For God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both the Lord and Christ. I apologize, that wasn't Paul, that was Peter. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, um, both Lord and Christ. So the gospel is very, very simple. It's not complicated. Um, it's, it's, it's simple, but it, at, the, at the same time, you will spend the rest of your Christian life beginning to grasp and to, to unfold the true message of the gospel. So just to summarize this first session, we're talking about a biblical basis, the priority of ministry. Every Christian is called to be a witness and to be a disciple maker. Um, before Jesus went up to the Father, he gave us his last mandate, which was to go into all the world, to take this message and make disciples of all nations. He promised us power from the Holy Spirit that we would not only go in our own ability, praise God, but we would go in his ability and we would expect signs and wonders to follow the message. We also looked at what true leadership looks like in the body of Christ. True leadership is not just to do all the work ourselves, but it's to train, to equip, to make people whole in the love of God so that they can, so that every believer can share that message. We're, we're called to equip and empower, empower people as leaders to be a witness. And then lastly, we touched on what that message is. It is good news. The world doesn't need more religion. It doesn't need, need more of our ideas. It doesn't need to be weighed down with weight. It needs to be 
set free with the love of God. And as a believer, we are called to share and show that message with people. We are we have a good news message that most likely the world never has never heard before. Much of the world has been Christianized, but it has not been truly given good news, true evangelism. So my friends, I pray that these truths would go deep into your hearts. I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would work with these truths. And I want to encourage you to go back over, to review some of these notes, to meditate on the scripture, because our goal is not just that you would have information, um, but that you would have revelation that causes transformation in your life and, and, and causes you to walk in the newness that God has called you to. So on the next session, we're going to look at some of the motives for ministry.